During the 1950s and 60s, the civil rights movement electrified youth from around the country into mass action and organization. Today, students still mobilize and lead their communities to make positive change. 1950s, Little Rock Nine, School Desegregation, Claudette Colvin, and Emmett Till. Following the Second World War, the United States seemed to be prosper prospering. The economy was booming, politicians were touting tra traditional values, and the mass culture industry was painting a picture of a perfect society. Everything seemed to be under control. However, as economic prosperity lifted many individuals into picturesque suburban life, millions of people were facing violence, repression, poverty, and discrimination because of the color of their skin. While white teenagers were going to drive throughs and saw cops, black teens were at the forefront of a new movement, fighting for their civil rights. Legal segregation, a system practiced for almost 100 years, after the abolition of slavery, held that separate but equal facilities for different races of people was constitutional and just. But from the beginning, it was apparent that the facilities were in no way equal. Public schools for Black students had less fun funding, fewer teachers, poor quality books and desks, and were held within old, decrepit buildings. Furthermore, Black students were often expected to walk or be driven unnecessary distances to attend a segregated school. In 1951, 13 parents filed a class action lawsuit against the Topeka, Kansas Board of Education for this very reason. They held that the schools their children attended were not equal to that of white children. Several parents attempted to enroll their children in schools much closer to their homes, but were rejected. The court ruled against the parents, stating that the, school were essential, the schools were essentially equal. In 1953, with the aid of the NAACP, the case reached the Supreme Court. The following year, the court reached a unanimous decision in favor of the families and stated that if segregation could provide equal facilities to the psychological effect it creates is inherently unequal. The opinion of the court was that to separate black children from others of similar age and qualifications solely, solely because of their race generates a feeling of inferiority as to their status in the community that may affect their hearts and minds in a way that unlikely to ever be undone. Throughout the rest of the 50s and 16s, liter 60s, literal battles were fought over letting black children go to school. The 1950s saw the beginning of a war against segre segregation. Nine black teenagers known as the Little Rock Nine were the first to integrate Arkansas's Central High School. The governor, Orville Faubus, called in the National Guard to the prevent the students from entering the school. Elizabeth Eckford, a student part of the Little Rock Nine, was only 15 years old when, in, your, in her own words, walked up to a guard who had let the white students in. He didn't move. When I tried to squeeze past him, he raised his bayonet, and, the, and then the other guards moved in, and they raised their bayonets. They glared at me with a mean look, and I was very frightened, and I didn't know what to do. I turned around and the crowd came toward me. They moved in and they moved closer and closer. Somebody started yelling, drag her over the street. Let's take care of that N-word. It took two weeks before the students finally were able to get inside the school. An angry mob of over 1,000 people, as well as the National Guard, surrounded the school until a federal division came and accompanied the students inside. They and their families received death threats and the following year, all the high schools in the city closed. Youth were also active participants in protesting against segregation and led the sit-in movement. In 1955, a 15-year-old girl by the name of Claudette Colvin was arrested for refusing to give up her seat on a bus to a white person. She was arrested and harassed by the police. Since then, she has been dubbed the original Rosa Parks, and in regard to the incident has stated, history kept me stuck to my seat. I felt the hand of Harriet Tubman pushing down on one shoulder and Sojourner Truth pushing down on the other. In 1958, members of the NAACP Youth Council from Oklahoma City staged a sit-in at the Katz Drugstore lunch counter. The group of students went from business to business and staged sit-ins and eventually desegregated all of the town's restaurants. High school and college students led the sit-in in movement 
through the 50s, from Baltimore to Wichita. However, segregation was not the only aspect of society that, that began to dispute. The murder of 14-year-old Emmett Till galvanized thousands of people to action against racism. In 1955, while visiting his family in Mississippi, he allegedly grabbed a white woman's waist and said obscenities to her. These allegations were later revealed to be false, but not after the woman's husband and half-brother tortured and killed Emmett and tossed his body in the Tallahatchie River. His body was found three days later and his mother defiantly held an open coffin funeral to show the world what racism did to her son. Tens of thousands of people attended the funeral and urged the leaders to get justice for Emmett Till. Unfortunately, the two men were freed by an all-white jury on charges of kidnapping and murder. The following year, they openly admitted they had killed him in an interview with Look Magazine. Today, 65 years later, Emmett Till has still not received justice. His murder acted as a catalyst in the advancement of the civil rights movement. Martin Luther King Jr. led a rally commemorating his life and soon after began the year-long Montgomery bus boycott. The death of Emmett Till and the integration of Central High School inspired many Black teens to take action and organize. The 1960s. <clears throat> University strikes student students, students for a democratic society, SNCC, Children's Crusade. Um, Greensboro sit-ins. Emmett Till acted as the instigation for a lot of <clears throat> rallies, protests, and sit-ins, comparable to George Floyd, whose tragic story acted as an instigation for Black Lives Matter protests this year. Greensboro sit-ins were led by four students at North Carolina Agriculture and Technical State University. Their goal was to force Woolworth Company store to implement desegregation and serve both white and black Americans. These sit-ins got larger and eventually high school students from Dudley High School nearby were also participating. These sit-ins led to boycotts of other segregated lunch counters and eventually some counters started to desegregate. However, Woolworths remained segregated until after the Civil Rights Act 1964 was passed. The Children's Crusade of 1963 was a march led by students in Birmingham, Birmingham, Alabama, whose purpose was to march to the mayor's office for three consecutive days and demand that Bir Birmingham be desegregated. These marches got incredibly violent and led to intense police brutality that was specifically targeted at the children who were mostly under the age of 18. Birmingham head of police, Bull Connor, directed his officers to spray the children with power hoses, beat them with batons, and set dogs after them. These children wanted to lead a peaceful march and protest in a nonviolent way, and they were met with unmerited force and brutality. Over thousands of kids were jailed. The Selma marches in 1965 helped to bring about the Voting Rights Act of 1965. Many prominent figures in the civil rights movement, such as Martin Luther King Jr. and Malcolm X, worked to make this march prominent and in the eye of the media. The first march from Selma to Montgomery was on March 7, 1965, and it later became known as Bloody Sunday. People were attacked by police with batons and tear gas. Along with hoses and other means of brutality, many were injured and arrested by the end of the first day. In 1960, the Students for a Democratic Society was founded and became proponents of the New Left, a movement that advocated for issues such as women's rights, gay rights, civil and political rights, and drug policy reforms. Many of those who participated in SDS wanted to see young Black people, wanted to see young Black people see and live the meaning of Black power. SDS started as a branch of the socialist organization League for Industrial Democracy. Most of their work was directed to civil rights struggles, especially for those of Black people of color. These young adults wanted to make Chester, Pennsylvania one of the battlegrounds of the civil rights movement. They were inspired by Brown v. Board and wanted to desegregate all public schools of Pennsylvania. They also advocated for free college, were against the draft for the Vietnam War, and organized protests against the war entirely in 1968. Eventually, the SDS dismantled due to inner disputes, but in 2006, 
two high school students, Jessica Rapchick and Pat Court, reached out to past members of SDS and restarted the organization. In their new mission, they described themselves as a progressive organization of student activists intent on building a strong student movement to defend our rights, to educate and stand up against budget cuts. The Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee was a civil rights group founded in the 1960s to give young black kids a voice and way to enable themselves during the civil rights movement of the 1950s to 1970s, whose work is still being done to this day. The 1970s Black Panthers. After the passage of the Civil Rights Act, many young black people were still disillusioned with American society. Seeing that not much had materially changed for them, the post-war ec economy had faded and the black population was facing an unemployment crisis. Poverty and violent racism were still widespread. Many black people, young and old, were frustrated by the perceived lack of change. In 1966, two student, college students named Huey Newton and Bobby Seale founded what was to become one of the most influential organizations of the time, the Black Panther Party. Following the killing of several unarmed Black men, Seal and Newton had the idea of harnessing the anger and frustration that resulted from the murders into community defense. They began to recruit young Black people for an armed police watch program. The new group was contracted as a security detail for Malcolm X's widow and began to make, get more widespread attention. They held rallies educating Black communities on self-defense and politics. Politicians and police were threatened by the show of power because the Panthers made sure not to break any gun laws. In 1967, the California State Assembly convened to discuss the Mumford Act, a piece of legislation specifically written with the intent of disarming Black Panthers. It criminalized open carrying firearms and was signed into law by California Governor Ronald Reagan. 26 Panthers were dispatched to the assembly and several, including Bobby Seale, were arrested, but their reach only grew. They began putting out a newspaper, which in the second issue contained their 10 point program as follows. We want freedom. We want power to determine the destiny of our community. We want full employment for our people. We want an end to the robbery by the capitalists of our black community. We want decent housing fit for shelter of human beings. We want education for our people that exposes the true nature of this decadent American society. We want education that teaches us our true history and our role in the present day society. We want all black men to be exempt from military service. We want an immediate end to police brutality and the murder of black people. We want freedom for all black men held in federal, state, county, and city prisons and jails. We want all black people when brought to trial to be tried in court by a jury of their peer group or people from their black communities as defined by the Constitution of the United States. We want land, bread, housing, education, clothing, justice, and peace. This radical program brought the Panthers into the ire of the federal government. Such a popular movement supporting socialist policies would not go unpunished in Red Scare America. The Panthers were advocates of Maoism and Marxism-Leninism, opposed the Vietnam War, and stated that they will not fight and kill other people of color in the world who, like, who, like Black people, are being victimized by the white racist government of America. In 1967, the FBI authorized its counterintelligence program to target so-called Black nationalist hate groups, which included the Black Panthers for some reason. Previously, they had targeted Martin Luther King Jr., the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, and the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. They had wiretapped King's home and had told him to kill himself. For the Panthers, however, they started to try divide them from their allies. They mailed threatening letters to other Black empowerment groups in the name of the Panthers. They contributed to the jailing of Huey Newton and other members and ended up murdering Fred Hampton, the chairman of the Illinois Black Panther Party while he slept, as well as Mark Clark, a fellow Panther. They fabricated evidence to put Geronimo Pratt, a high-ranking member, in prison for 27 years for a crime he didn't commit. All this to suppress a revolution. The government tried so hard to paint a negative image of a group which had only defended itself 
had fed children, had registered people to vote, and which had taught people the true history of the United States. That any acknowledge of our past is a threat to the United States. In 1970, the party reached its peak with over 5,000 members and offices in 68 cities. Medical clinics, free breakfast programs, community events, and educational outreach were offered to millions of people around the country. But internal divisions and outside threats weakened the party for the rest of the decade, until in 1982, the party dissolved. But their legacy lives on. Numerous groups today carry their torch, and the Black Panthers remain an inspiring example of people power. If a bunch of college students were able to become a serious threat to the power of the American government, if they could do it, we can too. The 1980s, mass incarceration, war on drugs, and the Black youth vote. The start of the 1980s in America was met with the election of President Ronald Reagan, a man dedicated to carrying on Nixon's legacy of law and order, tough on crime, and three strikes policies that worked to incarcerate Black Americans for petty drug-related crimes. During and slightly before the start of the decade, Inner city black communities such as South Central, Compton, and neighborhoods in Baltimore, Detroit, and New York City were facing astonishing rates of crack cocaine distribution and usage. This was not a coincidence. In fact, the CIA was personally responsible for funneling hard drugs into inner cities in order to target black and Latino people of color in the war on drugs starting during Reagan's presidency. By planting and distributing crack to drug lords in predominantly poor, POC neighborhoods, law enforcement then had a legitimate justification for why so many Black and Latinx Americans were being incarcerated. However, since the 1980s, there has been extensive research and evidence perpetrating the CIA and causing the rise of crack distribution in these communities, and thus it is evident that the war on drugs was created and enforced to weaken and criminalize people of color in America. Reagan made the use and possession of certain illicit drugs illegal and punishable by incarceration, and therefore many Black and Latinx people were pushed into the prison system at astonishing rates. Under the Reagan administration, the prison population rose from 329,000 to 627,000, almost doubling. In this astonishing increase, a disproportionate amount of these imprisoned were Black, mostly being men. The average age range for the black men imprisoned was 25 to 39, a troubling statistic as the destruction of the black family was implicated. In August 1986, Article of Ebony, a black run magazine committed to sharing and maintaining the black voice ran an article entitled, The Crisis of the Black Family, in which the authors asked, are black males on the list of endangered species? This was alarming to say the least. Black males were shipped off to prisons at such a staggering rate that Black communities were looking around and seeing a sea of distinctly female faces. This caused intense problems, especially for Black youth. As fathers disappeared into prisons, mothers were charged with maintaining an income and caring for their children, elderly, and their homes. From 1971 up to 1986, the amount of Black households headed by women increased by 113%. Unemployment rates for Black people in the 80s were double that for white people, and the number of Black children living in a two-parent household was only 41%. As life became more ambiguous and terrifying, Black youth also turned to the drugs that the CIA pumped into their communities, and thus the mass incarceration rate grew. To this day, Black youth are imprisoned at almost double the rate of the national youth average. It was, and still is, a vicious cycle that villainizes poor Black Americans, simply because they are poor Black, simply because they are poor and Black, and therefore our government and justice system believes they do not merit anything more than a violent controlling thumb of the prison industrial com. Many youth groups spoke out against the trend in mass incarceration and voiced their opinions in magazines such as Ebony due to rampant racism, much of their advocacy was undocumented. Ebony ended up going bankrupt and the magazine is no longer held on the pedestal that it once was on many black homes. Although they are now accessible in Google Books, this platform isn't commonly used by the general public and the magazines are hard to find if you don't know where to look. 
This is an example of how Black advocacy is historically silenced. The 1980s were also a time where Black involvement in politics was skyrocketing, and along with it, youth advocacy for voting rights and the importance of voting. In 1984, Jesse Jackson ran for United States president on the platform of bringing equal rights and opportunity for all Americans of all racial backgrounds. His run for the presidency, although unsuccessful, initiated a wave of Black politician po political candidates across the country, including Thomas Bradley for Los Angeles mayor, Harold Washington for Chicago mayor, and Maxine Waters for California legislator. James Chase was elected mayor of predominantly white Spokane, Washington in 1982. This inspired marginalized young Black voters to actually believe in the power of election. And his election set a trend in Eastern Washington of Haydn's Black voter participation. In the 1980s, Southern states shockingly led the way in the number of Black elected officials. And this was a direct result of vo voter participation, especially young Black voters. Faced with mass incarceration, the war on drugs, and the dismantlement of the Black family, Black youth showed up in the 1980s and enacted change through voting and involvement in political progress. The 1990s Rodney King protests. Following the beginning of the tough on crime mindset of political leaders in the 80s, mass incarceration rates continued to skyrocket. The effects of the war on drugs continued into the 90s and numerous bills were passed by bipartisan elected officials such as the 1994 crime bill and the three strikes provision, which ultimately hurt the black community the most. In 1991, video footage caught several officers severely beating and torturing a Black man named Rodney King in Los Angeles. This was a tipping point of numerous incidents of police violence that happened on a regular basis. One year later, in 1992, all four policemen were on trial, for, on trial were acquitted, three of whom were white. Another specific event that caused unrest was the murder of a 15-year-old Black teenager. Latasha Harlins, that same year. She was murdered by a store owner after allegedly stealing an item, and Latasha's killer was given probation. Emotions were high, and protests broke out in South Los Angeles, with most people of color in the streets. In retaliation, George Bush deployed thousands of army troops to the area, as well as federal officers. At the end, there were 2,000 injured, 6,000 arrested, and 50 deaths, including LAPD, LAPD murdering 10 protesters. Another popular medium of protest for young black, black youth during this decade was hip hop. During the end of the 1980s, Public Enemy was dominating rap charts with songs about fighting racism and tyranny. The 1990s decade was considered the golden era of hip hop and included numerously political charged references. In 1991, one third of the number one hits on the rap charts had political references in them, an all time high. Artists wrote songs about police brutality, such as NWA's Of the Police, Main Sources Just a Friendly Game of Baseball, and KRS One's Sound of the Police. There were additionally numerous references to the war on drugs, poverty, and mass incarceration. 2000s to present. Ferguson 20. Ferguson, 2020 Uprising, and Black Lives Matter. Ferguson. The Ferguson Uprising took place in Ferguson, Missouri from August 10, 2014 to August 25, 2014. These protests took place following the murder of Black teenager Michael Brown at the hands of a police officer, and a jury decided not to charge the officer. Darren Wilson with the killing. Demonstrators also demanded that more action be taken after a federal report was released that described how the town had a huge problem with racial bias in their policing. One of the protesters was Cori Bush, who was recently elected to U.S. Congress. In the documentary, Knock Down the House, she said, I took the streets to lend a hand as a nurse. What I was wanting to see was justice happen. It didn't happen, so I just kept going back again and again. 2020 uprising. Protests broke out beginning in Minneapolis following the murder of George Floyd. At this point, we probably all know the basics of what, ha what has happened and what has continued to happen, but we still felt the need to cover this due to the misinformation being spread all over the media. 
As of July 10th, protests have erupted in at least 104 cities, and the National Guard was activated in 21 states. One of the first main protests was in Seattle on May 30th, four days after George, George Floyd was murdered. Before all the protesters had even arrived, arrived, police were already lining up in riot gear. There were children there, and the police still used tear gas, mace, flashbangs, and other weapons against the protesters. You may have seen the video of the nine-year-old girl getting maced by a police officer. And I should also mention that almost all of the officers were covering their badge numbers. And reports from the police scanners tell us that they also didn't turn on their body cams. This prevents them from being held accountable. A few months later in Portland, there were reports and videos of unmarked vans with federal agents in them, snatching protesters off of the streets. The media has drastically distorted what has been happening, but the truth is this is fascism. And although the media, for the most part, isn't covering the protests anymore, they are still going on every day.